my name is Agnes Beretz and I'm an art historian. I was born in Budapest. I did my PhD in Paris and I have been working mostly teaching in New York um, for 22 years now. Uh, and I have been working on uh, Judith's work, but also on Simon Antai, another Hungarian-born artist who lived and died in Paris uh, for over, ooh, that sounds really bad, three decades. Come still closer. The larger the painting, the closer you have to be. Um, so this show here, where we are now, this is the apsis, the apsis space of the Kunsthalle, and it's a very particular kind of architectural unit, and very often it, it's a great space to stage a show within the show. What we have here, we have an exhibition by Reich's work, which is fundamentally a sort of retrospective, posthumous retrospective survey, uh, which provides a trajectory from the late 1940s until 2020, roughly, the, the year when he, uh, she died. And you do know that it's a centennial show, meaning that she was born in um, 1923. But after this whole survey, like quite brilliant, very dense, but also very airy overview of the work, we have this second exhibition, which provides a context for her abstract work in the post-war period in Paris. Um, I'm not sure how familiar or unfamiliar you are again with, uh, is there anyone who is doing art history? A little bit, okay. So this will be painting in a certain way the last period, the last great period of Western late modernist painting. And this takes us to Paris, which became a sort of victim place of what we refer to in art history as the transatlantic shift. Uh, at the beginning of the Cold War, Paris, which used to be the center of Western modernism, a hegemonic center which pretty much universalized its own artistic production globally, meaning whatever was taking place in Paris was the primary modality of artistic creation for the rest of the Western world, right? That has been a long-held hegemonic position Paris kind of... Uh, had, as I said, from the late 18 until the Second World War, late 18th century to Second World War. Things shift during and after the Second World War, and the transatlantic shift is the short name of that accumulative process during which basically New York stole the idea of modern art. This is a very famous, kind of old, but still very smart book by Serge Gilbeau, who was, um, who is, Serge is still around, an art historian. He used to teach at, uh, in Vancouver at uh, University of British Columbia for four dec decades. And the title of the book which he published in 1983 about this transatlantic shift is How New York Stole the Idea of Modern Art. Right? And it's not just about art, it's also about economy, politics, Cold War kind of, you know, uh, processes and it's accumulative. It starts in the 40s and it ends in 1964 when the very young Robert Rochenberg, an artist born in Texas, won the first prize, the Grand Prix at the uh, Venice Biennial. And we customarily in post-war art history tend to think that that's the moment when this process of the transatlantic shift, right? When New York's becoming the new center has ended. Today there is no center. You may know that too. There are important places. New York is still one of them. Paris, um, London is another one. But you know, the most important places no longer located in Europe or in North America. Um, I would think that Shanghai um, probably is the most important place when contemporary art is made, shown, and sold. But that's another story, right? The globalization of the art world after the end of the Cold War, which started in the 1990s. So let's come back to the good old-fashioned Euro-Atlantic axis and stay with Judith. And this is 1956, um, and it's called Explosion or Adburst. The French title is Eclatement, Eclaté. Right? It's kind of, you know, bursting out, exploding. It's something very dynamic, something very aggressive, something which can relate to humans. We can adverse, right? We can lose, lose uh, ourselves to arguments or give ourselves into anger. But it could be also something can adverse, could be cosmic, right, or natural. 
What you see here is a painting which was painted on an un a very base, thin base layer. It looks almost like raw canvas. And then the rest is not traditional painting materials, but powdered industrial pigment with industrial oil mixed together. Um, and not only the materials are non-artistic or unconventional, but also the way it was made is equally unconventional. No brush has been ever used in any of the paintings by Judith Reich here. So none of them had brush and artist oils, none of them had classical kind of, you know, grand gesso or sizing liquid um, uh, on the support, which is evidently the canvas or the paper. What he, she did was she threw up uh, throwing up, not like puking, uh, vomiting, that can be also adverse, right? But throwing up, meaning that kind of hurling up, right? Uh, pounds, mounds of industrial pigment mixed with industrial oil. And after that, he, you, she used, very often I mix, uh, how many of you are native Hungarian speakers? Hands up, okay. So everyone can identify. Uh, you know, we have a beautifully sexless language in Hungarian, so I notoriously and persistently uh, mix the pronouns, so he and she. So, which in this case, because this is about querying the history of obstruction in the late 20th century by her, actually makes perfect sense. But I apologize for misidentifying, you know, the protagonist with the he and she mix. Anyway. So what she did was, after this man were heard up to the canvas, she fabricated herself, she sort of Mickey Mouse, if you like. Um, it was a kind of bricolage method. Using a metal curtain rod, she made something which was a little bit like a sword, a metal kind of device, and with large gestures, basically moved and pushed, right, the paint removing it, scraping it, animating it. So there is a double animation. Once the painting, the matter, right, gets movemented when it gets onto the canvas, there's also randomness, accidentality, the contingency of the body and the contingency of the matter, the pigment, right? And the second moment of when the gesture and the artist's body kind of works on the canvas is when she shapes it. You do see that there are, the, surf, the matter kind of sits in there, kind of, in globes, like globules, the whole thing has a very high relief, like textural, heavily kind of, you know, layered presence. And you also see the swiftness, right? The speed, the immediacy of the physical gesture. So that's Judith in 56, and this is the centerpiece of this second exhibition within the exhibition. And now I would like you to move a little bit just back, just back enough that you can see a few pictures on the side because what you have here is a selection of artists who were working in Paris around the same time. We are in the mid-50s, right? Uh, um, the Reich picture is 1956. And uh, what you have here, on the one hand, you have paintings, especially those two by Ferenc Fiedler, another Hungarian-born artist, a very good artist, still somewhat underrepresented. Um, who is playing with the same idea of layered materiality, right? His is all over, right? So we are going from edge to edge, but nonetheless, like in Judith's picture, you do see this accumulated matter as an organizing principle of the painting. And then there is, of course, so next to Fiedler, uh, we have Jean Dubuffet, huh? Jean Dubuffet, who is a Paris-based artist, a French artist who came to art rather late. He used to be a wine merchant, actually. And in 1941 or two, he finally decided that, okay, he started painting, but um, it took him a while to throw himself into, you know, to become an exhibition artist. And this is not abstract like every other work in this room is. Uh, it has this grotesque, caricaturesque figuration, but you do see that the way he layered, right, the oil, the artist oils, um, and then he carved. It's almost like cave paintings or, you know, uh, something very childlike, very primal. By the way, he was one of the founders of what we, what we call l'art bru, uh, acultural arts, outsider arts, art which is not cultured, not sophisticated, art after the war in response to the trauma of the Second World War, right? Which no longer continues the legacy of Western art, but breaks with it. 
And this is something we have to think about, that everything is made here in the 50s and the 60s is made in a city, which not only did it lose, Paris lost its primary universal hegemonic position within the Western art world, but also this is a city where economically, culturally, morally, heavily corrupted, right? Europe is in ruins. The Second World War is a catastrophe on all fronts. So it is from this catastrophe. So you can think about collective trauma, uh, very much that, you know, how do we continue painting? You know, the famous statement by Theodor Wies and Grund Adorno, one of the figures we associate, the writer and the thinker and the philosopher who we think of associate with the Frankfurt School, the famous lines, right, that it is barbaric to write poetry after Auschwitz. So how do we continue painting? And Dubuffet's answer was to embrace the barbaric, to, to make something which remem reminds us of children's art or the art of the mentally ill, etc. So texture, we have textures. How about the rest? We have Hans Hartung, very important Paris-based painter, Simon Antai, Hungarian-born Paris-based painter, and another Simon Antai right there. And there you can relate to another element of uh, Judith's picture. The previous circle was about textures. Here we have movement. Not only movement, but there are these gestures with, in the case of Judith's painting, and you need to realize that she's a woman and her painting is the most aggressive, the most forceful, the most present. She has the most gravitas in this room, right? Which is fascinating that a woman artist does this radical work in the 50s. But also, you see that these gestures that she makes are very similar to the gesture sign on Hartung, when the, when the dynamism of a moving arm, don't fall, uh, the dynamism of a moving arm is present, or in the anti, where you do have this very calligraphic, almost like oriental calligraphy. Of course, Chinese and Japanese calligraphy is a very important etalon, something a lot of artists emulated, both in New York, but also in Paris at the time. And then again, with Antai, you have this agitated kind of repeated, right, arm and hand movement. So we have a body which makes gestures, which reminds us of calligraphy, writing. It's very physical, it's immediate. The painting is about the body that trace transposed to the canvas. And we have the accumulated matter, like taking painting away from the flatness of the modernist picture plane and into something which is structural, structured, and heavier. So these are the two threads. What else? This part here, this exhibition, has a lot of other important Hungarian artists, uh, Sobel, uh, Agota Vajto. Um, on the other wall, we have uh, Kolozsvári, a few artists who are still, we are coming into terms with. So it's both a kind of Hungarian-French cross-section to give you an inventory of what abstraction could be, how abstraction could look like in Paris, both in the hands of French or French-Canadian. We have a very beautiful Jean-Paul Riopelle on the other side of this wall, a small painting with super heavy oil. He was Canadian, well, he was based in Paris at the time. So we have a little cross-section, right? of different modalities of European abstraction in Paris in the hands of Hungarian and French painters. So now we need to ask a question, how did, she, how did she get to this? How does a woman born in Kapuvar in May 1st, 2023, get to this point, right, when this very radical, very oppositional, oppositional meaning against then prevalent modes of painting in Paris, how, does this, how did this come into being? That's the question. So it's not a rhetorical question. We have four rooms which answer to this question. And what we're going to do now is you will turn around and we will march straight back to the first room and you will see a small self-portrait study showing uh, Judith Reich with a very piercing eye with an open white shirt. Let's go there and start again, okay? Anyway. So this is the painting I wanted you to see. Um, and it's not a very interesting, as a painting, it's not particularly interesting. As a self-portrait, it's quite it. So here's a young woman who decided, you know, very early on, kindergarten age, that she wants to become a painter. And she did become a painter. She did not become a painter wholly and fully in Hungary. She had to leave 
to become one, which is very important. But I want you to see that there is a certain, it's an incredibly interesting picture. She kind of squeezes herself in between the frame. And although she's not in the straight smack middle, right? She's not in the, that center of the composition. You see that there's a little bit of kind of going to the side. But she has enough presence and a very severe, very austere, very confrontational gaze, right? Looking at us with the open white shirt. Huh? Uh, so that's the painter. And I just wanted you to have a get acquainted with her or the way she saw herself in 1944. This was in the middle of the war, right? During the Second World War, 1944 was a really bad year in Hungary. Uh, we already been occupied by the Germans. Of course, we were Nazi sympathizants, so it's, you know, it's just, but uh, it was a horrendous, horrendous uh, year. Um, and she was working with her fellow painters from the um, Hungarian Academy of Fine Arts in Felső Balog during the summer. So it's a summer residency picture. 1947, she left Hungary the first time. And if we go over there, which I would like to ask you to move, you're a very large group, so please just come. Let's make sure. I, wanna s I will talk about the whole wall so we can be here. Just you know, anchor, anchor yourself somehow in the middle. In 1947, she received a fellowship uh, at the Hungarian Academy in Rome which was run by an uh, Italianist, a great Hungarian scholar um, who kind of regularly received, and the Hungarian Academy in the Via Giulia in Rome, who received a lot of artists, Agnes Nemesnai, a poet, Sándor Vörös and uh, his uh, wife, uh, Ami Károlyi, uh, Janos Pilinski, another major, major poet in late 20th century Hungary. We're all there. So was uh, Shimon, Hantai Shimon, Simon Antai, uh, and his wife, also an artist, Zsuzsa Biro. And you did, with one of the gentlemen there, you see the red hair ginger man with the goatee. His name was Poldi, that's the nickname, Lipot uh, Böhm, uh, Zugor, Sándor Zugor, and Antal Biro, free man, and uh, uh, Judith Reig, the four of them kind of went to Rome as well. But they didn't just spend time on the Via Giulia, which is, by the way, a very lovely palazzo, and it's just near the river in Rome, uh, very close to the Campo de Fiori, actually. And they didn't just spend time in Rome. They traveled all across Italy. And this is an important thing, because the very first time, if you grew up in Hungary, you had a pretty good sense of, you had some, not pretty good, you had some sense of 19th century classical European modernism because of the private collections, right? Um, Herzog, Hatvani, uh, Majowski, et cetera. Many of those paintings are now ended up in the Museum of Fine Arts under not so mysterious or mysterious circumstances. Do your guess. Um, Judith knew those paintings. She was also very aware and very keen on Tivadar Chontvári Koska, right, who was a very important Hungarian, unclassifiable modernist painter. But Italy was really the first time when she had a, had a chance to see both early, um, late medieval and early Renaissance painting, Piero della Francesca, Giotto, uh, Masaccio in the Scrovegni Chapel, you know, in Padua. Uh, the Brancacci Chapel in uh, Firenze, but also modernism, because 1948 was the first Venice Biennale after the Second World War, uh, a Biennale which was, uh, I think, Bra not I think, I know uh, so, uh, Calder and Brock won the Grand Prix, and it gave her a chance to basically learn, right, in a rather cursory way, the classical avant-garde as well. So a double exposure, right? Early Renaissance or late medieval Maniera Greco type Italian painting on the one hand, mostly panel painting or frescoes, right? And then 20th century modernism, right? At the Venice Biennale uh, uh, in the Giardini in Venice. And look at this. This is called Hitchhiking between Ferrara and Ravenna. He paint, she painted this in Paris in 1950s, so there is a little bit of a delay, right? The experience itself took place in 1948, but she only got a chance to paint it as it is now, two years later, later in Paris. 
This was a picture which she kept in her very, very, very small house where she lived from 63 until 2020, her dad. A 40 square meter house with an attic, which was her studio. A house which she shared with the Muen on top, the very beautiful blonde woman with very angelic blue eyes, who was a British sculptor, Betty, Betty Anderson. And Betsy Anderson and Judith met in Ravenna uh, in 1948. They were both looking at the Byzantine mosaics in Ravenna in the San Vitale. They met, and save for two years of a break, they spent their whole life together. So they are hitchhiking that boom. Judith is in the middle, and Betsy. Uh, the love of Judith's life um, is on top. And if you look at this, this is a real hybrid, right? Um, it's a little a bit of a giotto, bit a bit of a kind of analytical cubist, flattened geometric planes. It's both modern and pre-modern. It plays a kind of trans-historical play, right? Between different phases and parts of painting. So, and it's, in a certain way, it's the beginning of a new life, a new life which happens when in March 1950, so he, she returns, I'm sorry, I'm running ahead. 1948, she returns to Hungary from Rome, and she's a leftist, you know, sympathies clearly, so she loved the idea of Hungary becoming a social democratic kind of state, especially after the Nazi lenient and then German occupied Hungary. Um, she was absolutely welcoming, theoretically, the leftist turn. But the leftist turn, of course, wasn't the leftist turn. It was a full-on Sovietization of the country, which also meant the imposition of socialist, realist doctrines to make art. That was not something she could live with or she wanted to live with. She wanted to paint the way she wanted, and she wanted to paint what she wanted, as she said. And there was something even more pressing. Her passport was taken away. And there was Betsy Anderson, right, on the other side of the Iron Curtain. So in order to paint and in order to meet Betsy, she tried eight times to sneak through the border. The ninth time she managed it in the middle of the night. She arrived to Austria without anything, right, in a single shirt, in a shoe and a pants. And that was it. And three months later, she arrived to Paris. It's pretty interesting, right? Uh, and in Paris, there was Simon Antai and his wife were already there, so she had friends to help her navigate Paris, which compared to Budapest was a very large city. It's still bigger than Budapest. Not that difficult to be bigger than Budapest, but that's another, that's another question. But Budapest is not that small either, right? But arriving to Paris in 1948 was a kind of frightening and exhilarating encounter, but then she met Betsy, right, again, and she stayed there until 63. I want you to look at this. This is called the Fisherman's Couple, and it's one of the covet self-portraits or double portraits, right? There in the 19th, 18th century, there was this, uh, especially in German painting, there was the, the Freundschaft build, right? The friendship picture, right? Um, they also made friendship cups in the 17th century. This is a friendship, but obviously we have two lovers here. Judith paints herself in a very androgyn manner. Already you see the androgynity in the self-portrait, right? She doesn't want to be, uh, she does not conform to the expectations of femininity in a traditional kind of, you know, conventional orthodox ways. She's a bit more creative than that. Uh, and here she paints herself as a man, essentially. And then here is Betsy, who you can recognize, Betsy, who you can recognize from that picture as well. Um, she made another picture like that. It's called the uh, worker-peasant friendship. And it's very tricky, like this one is tricky too, because stylistically speaking, this is absolutely in the sillage, right, of socialist realist Zdanovi. And Zdanovi is the Russian dude in the 1930s who comes up with the theoretical foundation of socialist realism. So it's very much in that kind of stylistically totally fits into what was expected from her or any other young painter in late 40s Hungary. 
and she painted another one, the worker-peasant friendship. But both of these pictures are a kind of pro projections of a desire, right? They are painted from the desire and the remembrance of the day spent with Betty, hoping that, yeah, it will happen another time again, that they will be standing next to each other. So we are in Paris, moving here. So what we have here is a whole wall of pictures, and there is a very radical shift. Suddenly we are, this is the beginning of obstruction in her practice, and um, for a while, until 45, late, late 54, 55, she is doing a double production, right? She has a few figurative, quite surrealistic pictures, and she also starts working on these obstructions. You do see that it's very colorful. All those muted colors, on the other hand, you know, the fisherman couple almost look like a fresco. There is this muted kind of, you know, terracotta, earth-colored, ochres, etc. Uh, here, suddenly, we have a burst of color. It's almost like taking the colors of someone like Fray Angelico, uh, the butterfly colors of Fray Angelico on acid, right? You acidify uh, the early Renaissance colors and create this very rich, very spectacular kind of palette. The titles of the pictures are interesting. The Eternal Unrest of Life. So what we have here, she puts up these very, very mixed, richly layered colors. And then what she does is not to paint more on top, but to remove. Right? And that's kind of interesting, right? Not only does she get back the chromatic richness, which is a bit more painterly, they are more painterly in a way than the previous pictures we've seen, but on the other hand, instead of putting the matter on the surface, this is what painters do. You have some stuff and you put the stuff on the surface. That's what painting is, it's mark making. Huh? Instead of making a mark, she takes it away. What you see here is a removal, is a very calligraphic, agitated again, oriental calligraphy, ideogrammatic kind of writing. Think of the Rosetta Stone in the British Museum, right? The Egyptian kind of writing, which took a while to decipher after Napoleon stole it um, uh, first. Um, and you also see that there is this whole idea of cosmic, astronomical, right? large scale, natural, organic kind of happenings, right? It's really a kind of cosmology, if you like. And before, straight before a parallel with this, she also created those, quote, comic obstructions. None of those have been shown before. It's the first time they are shown publicly. And also the self-portrait and the little picture in the middle, which is called Rome. Uh, it's almost like a Hogarth or a Goya kind of late Goyesque, uh, little genre painting. All of those are the first time on view in public here. So these, some of these paintings were part of her first solo show. So arriving in June 50, 1950 to Paris, um, bare feet almost. Um, four years later in November 1954, André Breton, who she was introduced to via Simon Antai, saw the pictures in the studio and offered her a solo exhibition in Paris at the gallery, which was used by the surrealist, the members of the surrealist group at the time. If you do literature or art, uh, you are familiar with Breton, who in 1924, October, launched surrealism in Paris, publishing the Manifesto of Surrealism, Psychic Automatism, Surrealism, which was all about a kind of adopting a Freudian vocabulary, right? And to create something which was visually or literary equivalent of unconscious processes, interior monologues, uh, playing with the domain of the Freudian drives, right? Eros, which is basically, uh, you know, sex, sexuality, eroticism, and Thanatos, uh, our mortality and our fear of death, because according to Freud, those are the things like the Stimmung, the, the trib and the, the drives, which are the foremost motivations for the human psyche. And Breton wanted to create a visual and a literary movement which takes the consequences from Freudian psychoanalytic theory and tries to speak to not to the reality, but, and not to the eye, but to the inner eye and to psychic processes. He was delighted with her. She sa he said, Breton wrote that for a woman, this is, you know, for a woman, this is really great. Uh, classic uh, 
uh, patriarchal praise. Uh, he did recognize Judith's talent, hence the invitation to show, hence the protection. And Judith had an exhibition which was a shocking discovery for many artists, but immediately after the exhibition, she decided to not to want to be associated with either Breton himself nor with the Surrealists. Which is a very interesting thing, but you have to remember that she left Hungary with great difficulty to not to be associated with any label, any school, any tendency, any movement. Right? She's also a queer woman and an immigrant artist in Paris. Right? So as a not belonging, as a being on the margins, in opposition of both the cultural politics of Paris at the time, but also the sexual politics and the body politic of the French Republic after the Second World War, right? that was an experience very deeply felt, a formative thing for her. So the not belonging, choosing in a rather admirable way to do her own thing for the rest of her life, pretty much away from immediate responses, praises, and many things that remained the modus vivendi for her the rest of her life, which also, of course, made her reception, both critical reception and commercial reception and representation, somewhat problematic. Because if someone continuously stepping back and turning its back to the art world, right? The art world, the expression does not exist before 64, when Arthur C. Danto proposed the term not exactly the way as people understand it today, but that's another lecture. I'm not going there. So he, she turned her back to the art world, right? So obviously, praising her, seeing her, receiving her, dealing with the consequences of the work was somewhat problematic, right? You do have artists like that, right? The kind of chosen solitude, um, which is a form of autonomy. But how do you declare this autonomy in a world when artworks are becoming nothing but commodities, right? That was a constant struggle for her. How do you resist the hyper-commodification of art? How do you not conform yourself to the expectations of critics or dealers, right? Or museum curators. This is a constant struggle. Um, the art historians here probably know the brilliant book by the German art historian Oskar Bachmann the Kunstler, uh, the, the um, Ausstellung Kunstler, the exhibition artist, right? It's a new category coming into being in the 19th century when the market, the modern market starts in Paris and London in the 1850s. But how do artists negotiate, right? When the old patronage systems are gone and the market comes in, how do you negotiate what you do? Who is your audience? And how do you try to make a living? Okay, we're gonna return to this, but before we would, uh, yeah, we have to go to the other side because the picture we started with in the secondary show, or I'm not saying secondary, the show within the show, I would like us to go over to, the, to that wall there because that, that's the series, right, to which the 1956 Eclatement, what we started with, belongs to. Most of you probably don't spend that much time looking at a picture as you do now because we all scroll through stuff. So painting teaches us to learn to look slowly, to start to pay attention to things which we are otherwise oblivious. So it's a, this is an important learning moment for all of us to relearn how to spend time with something, right? An image, a picture, which is not digital data, not on a screen, but something, a material you know, manifestation in front of our eyes. Can you see that from there? Good. Okay, so what we have here is um, a whole wall of adverse, right? Eklatman, the French title, the Hungarian is Robbanash, for those of you who understand Hungarian. So what changed? Well, a lot of things changed. Color, which dominated the canvases there, here became residual, almost like a second tote. Here you have reds, here, there you have some oranges, yellows and reds. Um, but there it's black, and here you have a little bit of green, which kind of almost like dirt, like speckle, right? It's kind of covet, secondary color comes in. There's a very obvious kind of, you know, impoverishment, strategic impoverishment of the palette. Chromatically, we are getting very subdued. So much so that each and every canvas here, like the picture we started with in the apsis, remember the vertical 56 picture? Everything you see is essentially dominated by black and white contrast, 
And of course, you do remember that black and white is not a real color. Johann Wolfgang Goethe, the German writer, politician, public intellectual, blah, blah, blah. Goethe, who has a really, really great color theory from the early 19th century, Goethe called black and white non-material, non-physical colors, right? Because black, we don't have light, so we don't have color. White is we have too much light, so color cannot emerge, cannot break. And that's true to color as light, but also color as substance. Because the two are not exactly the same, you know, that color is, you know, it's, it's two things, color, at least two things colors are. Okay, so what else changes? No color. This is where everything I said about how this figure grants. Painting is about figure grants. Since Cezanne, at least, maybe Monet or very late Goya, but Cezanne for sure. The whole history of modernist painting was about how to eradicate this duality between figure and grand. How to make it complicated. What is the figure? What is the grand? What is empty? What is full? What is on top? What is underneath? What is made and what is there? So you can see that, yes, these black stuff, right? The streaks of paint, again, work the same way as I explained already, right? Hurling up the mounds of industrial matter, using a fabricated metal tool like a sword, and making these very performative, large corporeal gestures, playing with both the contingency of the human body and of the contingency of the, of the paint itself. But it's really interesting because they are figure grands, but they also go all over, right? It's a very interesting thing that they are also kind of breaking out of frames. You have a lot of diagonals. She loves diagonals, diagonals movement things. That's why Mondrian never used it, you know, Mondrian grids. No diagonals after 1923, four. Uh, only 90 degree vertical horizontals. Why? Because it has to be rigid. It has to be uh, hieratic, right? Uh, like prehistoric art. When you have a diagonal, you immediately have motion. If you have motion, you have space, you have time. The hint of a narrative, even all it is in a diagonal is a line, but a narrative possibility already emerges. Diagonals are dangerous things because they are the launching pads for any kind of spatio-temporal shift or narrative reading. But he wants, she loves her diagonals. There is always a diagonal to, to kind of invite us to think about this motion. So here we are getting out of the frame in a very impoverished, minimalized kind of abstract idiom. And look at this. This is the suite, the continuation of the series. She calls this centre dominance, um, center, of do center of dominance or dominance center. And very clearly the centripetal and the centrifugal. Centripetal forces, centrifugal forces. Here we are coming back into the middle classical Western composition, right? We are in the middle, usually in a triangle, right? Triangular shape. This is how you compose. Look at high Renaissance stuff. You know, it's always we are triangulating in the middle. And that pretty much remains untouched. You know, Goya undoes it once, and then Manet undoes it again, and then Cezanne gets rid of it, and then Jackson Pollock, then he introduces the all over paintings right in 1948, painting on the floor, dripping the paint. Then that goes away. But it's really interesting because she wants to bring it in the middle. But remember the cosmic stuff, those circular elliptical spaces which look like astronomical maps or cosmological bodies, right? The rings of different things, very alchemical too, by the way, I didn't talk about that, but there is only so much I can talk about in an hour and 15 minutes or so, so not everything is set here. Uh, just remind, uh, remember that. So take the same palette and does these gestural things. You know, Willem de Kooning said that all the space I need as a painter is the, lamp, is the length of an arm. Right? That's the space of painting. There is the canvas, that's my body, that's my open arm, and that's the space, that's the space in which painting takes place. So there is this kind of anthropomorphic thing that you, and I want to ask you to do that. Every single time you look at a painting or a drawing here, because her drawings are equally gestural, physical, corporeal, and performative, I want you to think about how was this stuff done? How did she do it, right? What is the process? 
what is the performative condition for these marks to come into being, to be placed on that canvas or piece of paper. Okay? So it's a really interesting thing because that performative is a very key to her practice. And the second thing you should just not forget about is the fact that she's a woman painter. So when you see this very, very physical, brutally strong, very matter-driven, very aggressive, sort of macho painting, just think about for a second that this is a woman's working here. It's an absolute regendering of the idiom of obstruction in the 1950s and 60s, which is a very important thing because we do know, probably many of you know that in New York, the women painters were considered basically non-existent until the last like, 15 years ago. It started the revision, right, of women artists, Lee Krasner, Grace Hartigan, um, second generation, Joan Mitchell, who is a very strong and very beautiful parallel to Rival's work. Uh, and in Europe, women artists were deemed, especially in Paris, absolutely secondary uh, until the 1980s. I said that in the first group too, the first woman who represented France at the Venice Biennial was the wonderful, wonderful Annette Messager in 18, 1983 or four early 80s. No other woman artist ever in the French pavilion, which is, you know, it's a bit rough if you think about this, right, the chronology. It's a very, very impressive room, and I haven't said that, but it's important that the show was curated by Carmen McClary, uh, who also organized Judith Reg's first museum exhibition in Hungary in 2005, right here in the Mucharnok. She was also very closely involved uh, in the second show you did had at Modem in Debrecen and the third one, which was at the Ludwig Museum in 2014. And he had a role, and he and uh, Eva Shosh, who is the director of Kalman's Gallery, the two of them had a quite important role in the late reception of Reg's work, not just in Hungary, but also internationally. And you know that at the moment we are very lucky because this show opens um, as of today. The Kisteli Museum has a very small but quite lovely, beautiful show about the figurative works in the church space there. It's, if you haven't seen it, please go and have a look at it because it's a great, great exhibition. And there is also Berlin, the Neue National Gallery in Berlin at this very moment is having another show of Reg's work. And Reg is, of course, included in the Pompidou, Tate Modern, uh, Metropolitan Museum, Guggenheim Museum, the last two in New York, and so is in MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art, also in New York. Um, okay, so here, mass writing, she called this, because again, the ideogrammatic, the calligraphic, you know, writing and painting and drawing are all autographic regimes because there is a body, there is a hand, and there is a matter, and we make a mark. And that mark functions as a kind of signature, the master stroke, the indelible presence of a body who marked that. Of course, you can also think about cave paintings, right? The handprints or the cave paintings in Jackson Pollock in 1948. So here, you do see that there is a shift, though. We are removing. She has been removing since the 50s, but here the removal becomes a very forceful gesture. What you register as a line, right? What you register as a gestalt, a shape, a form of something, is not so much what's painted, which was, by the way, smoothed on the canvas by hand, but what is being taken away. Swiftly, quickly, gesturally, again. Why is this interesting? because painting is about mark making. Here, painting becomes not mark making, but the taking away of the matter. Right? So he is, she's working via negativa, she's working with the under layers of painting, when the wide, the base of the canvas, the support comes out, the unpainted becomes important. And if you look to this side here, you see that again, from very muted, almost stone or earth color, the ochres and the moss greens there, we are going back to the non-color, right? Another shift, right? The way she moves between small and large, um, marked and removed color and non-color. And here we have the non-color, 1966, because what you see here is called um, Om, which is, means man, universal man, 
right? And this comes out of that series, the Ecriture uh, Hamas, the, the um, mass writing, um uh, in Hungarian. And he plays those pictures there. Um, right, did you see those three? Which she, he pushes the stuff to the frame. He empties out the center. There is nothing in the middle, just white, right? Uh, there is this, you know, you're asking that, what is, pic what is the pictorial plane? Painting becomes more about what is not painted. Painting is what is just framed and marked by the black line, right? This is, conceptually speaking, a total reversal of what painting used to be. The first artist, actually, I was told by Katalin Kesheru, an old professor of mine at the university, and she's very right that I shouldn't just say Cezanne, I should be referring to Gauguin too. But it's somewhere in the 1880s, 1890s, but I'm going to stick to Cezanne because that's what I'm the most familiar with. Or, and it's not true, but that's what I do the closest to me um, in affective ways. So Cezanne, who started to paint, everyone knows Cezanne, right? Paul Cezanne, the guy who paints the mountain, right? Outside of Aix-en-Provence, Montaigne saint Victoire, And he makes oil paintings. Unfortunately, we don't have any of these here. We also don't have aquarelles, so in Hungary it's a bit difficult to know that work, but Basel and the Tate in Europe, and most of them are in London and, um, and in the US. But anyway, so the Montaigne saint Victoire, and he paints the landscape, but many of the late paintings and the late aquarelles of Cezanne's about that mountain is what is the most important is not what he paints. He puts up these form colors, but when you see the white paper or the white gessoed empty canvas. So what happens via negativa in reserve, the unpainted, the white, the empty, the unpainted constitutes, becomes constitutive in terms of the composition and the reserve makes the picture. This is a total upside down, a total subversion of Western painting, right? We are afraid of the void, horror vacui. So we start decorating, right? Here we are not afraid of the void. The void is right there, smock in the middle, looking at us. So this reversal, and since we are at the genealogy of this modernist thing, Cezanne, and then of course, late Matisse. Matisse with the decoupage, the paper cutouts, when Matisse takes up the Cezanne legacy and starts to play with the white, the empty, the negative space, activates, right, everything, the whole center, the anchor of every Matisse paper cutout is not the color but the white. So this is what she plays with. And she paints these canvases and suddenly she notices that something looking like a body emerges, right? A torso, a crotch, or a side, right? Suddenly there is a body, an emergent body, a body which he did not want to paint, right? It wasn't intentional. It was one of those happy accidents, right? A kind of random emergence on the canvas. And she takes this body and makes it into a recognizable, giant, monumental torso. Torso, the body is never whole. The body is always, always fragmented, right? Um, you see again that everything I said about Eclatement, the thickness, the sculptural high relief, the matter of painting, right? And the matter of the body. Here it's interesting because we don't only see the artist's body making the painting, but we also see the body as a picture, right? The body not only a, a tool of making painting, but it becomes a representation. She called this series Om, which is neither man nor woman, but human being, right? And most of the bodies are mostly male bodies. When you see colors, very often a color is like on those two quite fantastic paintings when they are very vertiginous, very disorienting, because the diagonal, but come closer. Come, you could come. Um, the diagonal bodies kind of, you know, sort of float or better float, right? Or go up or down, descend or ascend depending on when you stand or where you, how you look at it. But um, let's make sure that they can see so you guys come ahead and have a look at it. So, but despite the fact that they are, uh, they are male bodies, in most cases we have a few women, and this is one of the very few women here. And I would like you to see that how exceptional it is that 
We know that until Picasso's Demoiselle de Vignon in 1907, um, that's the first picture where women are not fully painted naked for male pleasure, viewing pleasure, right? Demoiselle de Vignon of Picasso in 1907, the two women are looking at you, provoking you, being proud to be naked, fully aware of their sexual power. So that's a breakthrough moment. Monet's Olympia in 1863, another breakthrough moment. This too is a breakthrough moment. I want to connect this picture to that history of the female nude because women very rarely paint women. Contemporary artist Jenny Savie, English painter working in London, very successful, very large, very textured female nudes, always in fragmentation, very much against the, the doctrines of beauty, right? They are very fleshy, right? And somewhat object. A woman painting a woman, right? That's a very important kind of thing in the pattern of painting is, in certain ways, it's about, you know, uh, declaring power. And here a woman paints another woman, which is both vulnerable and monumental, right? And very much with the pubic hair especially, with the somewhat kind of, you know, the very hardly negotiated contours, very Cezannean contours, of course. All the Cezanne figures have this heavy contours, what she plays with. Um, it's a very important thing. Okay, why the bodies are important? She started to do the bodies in 66, and uh, although until this point she's celebrated in Paris, in 1966 she becomes a sort of a persona non grata, because people feel that only obstruction is radical and one God. Uh, no one accepted the fact that she is doing figurative painting. They felt that this is conservative, this is traditional, this is unacceptable. Right? So she basically loses a German dealer, Van der Lohe, who was a major dealer, having galleries in Munich and also München and also in Düsseldorf. Um, and she also loses her representation in Paris at that point. Right? So it's very interesting that cultural politics, the expectations of both dealers and critics, right? We were thinking about this conformity. How do you make what you do available to others? Painters don't paint because they want to accumulate paintings in their attic. Painters paint because they want to show the stuff to other people, hopefully at least curious people, if not smart people, as people are never smart. In crowd, we are never, you know, that's... Uh, but at least curious people, so they can have conversations, right? They, they can have some kind of reaction. Um, but in this case, Judith was pretty much deprived of that. In 1973, it was Betty, her, her love and partner, who herself was a sculptor studying with Henry Moore in London in the 30s and the early 40s. Betty opened the gallery, which was called Galerie Rencontre, which became a very important place in Paris. It was a tiny little gallery. And she managed it, she opened it, so Judith, right, her partner, will have a public platform and she can show her stuff. Um, so I want you to realize that what was the weight of these bodies, that she was marked retrograde. Now I'm arguing for a kind of subversive gender reading of the paintings, right? But that was not the case in, 60s, 60s, uh, in, in the late 60s in France. Okay. Here are three pictures. They're called guano. Guano is bird uh, waste, right? It's the, the waste matter, the feces, the fecal matter produced by birds, which accumulates and creates layers, layers which remind you of the Freudian wunderblock, right? You know, the Freudian, Sigmund Freud's kind of one of the metaphors he used for how memory works, how remembering is also forgetting, right? The double nature of uh, mnemonic work uh, for Freud was uh, compared to the wonder block, which like, you know, children have this magnetic stuff. You make something, make a drawing and then shake it and it disappears so you can start again. But if you use it often enough, right, after a while, there will be some residue so it gets dirty and the earlier memories kind of accumulate and create layers. It's also geology would be, geological strata, right? how things layer and accumulate. So these paintings were made on the floor. Uh, she covered the studio first. She covered the studio of her, the floor of her studio 
with paintings which she screwed up, the failures, the rejected one, the abundant works. Look at this. This is one of the dominant centers, right? The circular kind of, you know, paintings from the 50s. So she used these canvases to protect the floor, the wooden floor, the parquet floor of the studio. And for years, most of them are double dated, 58 to 63, because what happened, you know, she was painting. Her painting was very physical, so there was a lot of stuff flying around and then ending up on the floor. So the original failed painting and then many, many layers of stuff, all creating these thick surfaces. Right? almost like the oat pot of the buffet, right? And very textural. And then she reworked them. She inserted, she made a frame and inserted that rectangular thing which came back to her in the 80s. She had a whole series called Entrance Exit. Are we entering to something or something comes out of the painting? That's the figure grand duality, right? Spatialized through metaphors. Here, she covered it again and started to kind of scroll things into it, marking it, right? Um, and here she created this almost like a man here or some prehistoric, something ancient thing, right? Again, covering the rest of it. So basically she takes the accumulator trash, the waste material of the studio to rework it from the floor back to the wall, very much like Pollock's, Jackson Pollock's drip paintings created between January 1948 and the fall of 1950 when he stopped making them, right? Which really kind of revolutionized the way how we think about abstraction in Western art in the late modernist period. An important thing since I'm mentioning Pollock and the guano. So I, I'm an associate professor at the Pratt Pret Institute and the Sotheby's Institute of Art in New York, but I have been lecturing at MoMA for 19 years, uh, and I have been teaching at MoMA for 19 years. Uh, so I have a great familiarity, and um, I'm lucky enough to spend a lot of time very often with 10 people in the, with the Pollocks. But something very important happened with the Pollocks at MoMA um, five months ago, I think. Uh, they reorganized the fourth floor of MoMA, uh, which is the permanent collection. It's going from 1940 to 1970. And the first room, the big picture when you walk in, it's really a big picture. It's, um, it's the size of six single mattresses. It's Jackson Pollock one from 1950, one number 31, a very, very large drip painting. And you stand in front of it and you look to the right and you see Judith Reig, Guano, 1958-1963, right? a circular guano painted with white across, and then you turn again and there is a doorway to the second room and there is another Pollock, the first Pollock drip painting made on the floor, uh, number one, A1, uh, one, January 48 is the date of it. So Reg Judith is in between two Pollocks in the first room of the post-war collection, permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art. So there is Jackson Pollock who has been iconicized, branded, as a Cold War hero, 1949, Life magazine cover, right? Here he stands with a ciggy hang, sang, hanging from the corner of his mouth in boots, black jeans, black t-shirt, in front of a painting and the question, is, he the, is Jackson Pollock the greatest living artist in the US, right? 1949. And then suddenly we have an immigrant, Hungarian, queer woman painter right next to it making us to rethink the history of this horizontal, vertical kind of move, the same move that Pollock was doing, Judith is doing too. That's a pretty big deal. Right? In a museum which is notoriously has been very, very resistant to rethinking the representation of gender and the gender of art, especially in, you know, especially in the post-war decade. In contemporary art, it's very hard to not to, but uh, if you look around, you will see that um, there's a whole wall of works where suddenly the question, how was this made, right? Everything we have seen so far, since the very early pictures, the hitchhiking between Ravenna and Ferrara, everything had a very pronounced, very strong kind of physicality. Here things change. Every painting here was created in a very interesting way. Here, he noticed that if he 
moves in front of the paintings, um, very often using a sponge, sometimes never classical paint brush, you know, always unusual, unorthodox things. He was, she, she, she was walking in front of the painting and making these marks. It's a peripatetic, ambulatory thing, or standing in front of them and making something sequenced, rhythmic. This is much more discipline. This is much more order. There's a certain fluidity and continuity. Every picture here, uh, or most pictures, are called déroulement, or, you know, um, who? what is the English title of déroulement? I have absolutely no idea how it is translated. Unfolding. Unfolding, okay, unfolding, which is interesting that how it comes to being. You know, I don't use English titles. I know the French titles, and I, even the catalogue essay I wrote in English, but I never use the English titles, so sorry. Derum in French, unfolding English, Foyamat, the Hungarian. So why? Because this cursive writing like thing comes back, the physicality is somewhat subdued. All of these pictures are also made to music in a certain way. In this little wall, and there's a lot of pictures which she actually cut up, collaged, right? So the sizes are very often this result of constant reworking what she has been engaged with throughout her practice. There are a few which are called from the early 80s, the art of the fugue. And the reason why the fugue is, you know, the musical composition, right? The polyphonic musical composition, because she was listening to Bach, uh, Bach fugues, but also the Weltemperiertes Klavier. So Bach music, right? Baroque music becomes the kind of sequencing of how she works. She needed a force which helps her to stop, to suspend the gesture or restart. And she was using music to dictate what the body does, right? She also plays on many of these canvases, she plays with the idea that they are painted on the other side, and what you see just seeps through. So she embraces the recto verso. She works on both sides of the canvas. Another kind of radical destabilization of the picture plane, the vertical picture plane. And as you see, if you're familiar with Warhol and the Warhol portraits, then very often, or the Death and Disaster series, right? When we have usually silk screen pictures, mechanically mediated pictures printed on a canvas on one side, and there is a monochrome panel to the other side, right? Asking you that what is something and what is nothing. Can we argue that the monochrome is empty? No, it is not. So she invites you to consider not just movement, not just regularity, not just fluidity, but also how the layering of color, right? We were layering texture in guano. Here we are, semi-transparent layers of colors bleed into each other, a little bit like a Rotko, right? It makes you think about, you know, chromatic kind of interactions. I want you to think about duration too. Here, it's not quick, the movement is. Here we have a durational aspect. We are walking, we are ambulatory, the gestures are linearly lined up. It's a very different kind of method to mark than before. Uh, and here, the last things before we would finish in the next room, they're almost too pretty, aren't they? They're sort of disturbingly aesthetized, right? And very spectacular. And I want to refer to Matisse here because uh, Judith was not afraid of making things which were very aesthetized, right? And that's a hard thing to do because it's very close to what could be just obstructionist kitsch. And we have endless examples of that in contemporary art, endless, 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 right? Pretty pictures, right? Um, um, people love them because there is no narrative, so you just look at it as something beautiful. It's so apolitical, it so invites open-ended reading, so it's very easy to live with it, right? That's, that's something which very much exists in the language of abstract painting for a few decades. But this is a very kind of Matissean enterprise she's after with, right? Matisse, who never thought that radical painting and decoration are in contradiction, right? He had an ability and a capacity, and he was deeply invested, Matisse was, into trying to make painting which is both, I don't want to use the word pretty, 
I am also prefer to refrain um, to use beautiful. So let's just say decorative, right? There's a universal signifier here. So uh, how can painting be both radical and decorative? And Matisse thought that, yes, it can. It's a very difficult thing to pull off, but he could clearly do that. And you can argue that something similar happens here as well. He used, she used metal powders adding to the pictures. He put them vertical instead of horizontal. It's, um, and what happens immediately, you think about natural forms, atmospheric things, right? We are going back to the naturalistic, the biomorphic, the cosmological, what we saw in the very first room in the so-called surrealist pictures, but also in the cosmic obstructions. And something else, I want you to think about Warhol. Uh, actually, I already referred to Warhol because of the monochrome versus marked panel, right? The Warhol's dual panel, two panel paintings from the 60s death and disaster until the late portraits in the 70s. But here to Warhol oxidation painting, right? Uh, where uh, Warhol mixed metal powders, as did Judith, into the paint and then asked people to urinate over the horizontally placed canvas. And the urine, right, uh, kind of entered into a chemical interaction with the metal power, pad powder, so he ended up with something which was incredibly beautiful, yet made with piss. And he called them oxidation painting. It also makes you think about the relativistic nature of beauty, right? What do we see as beautiful and why? So this is all comes out of uh, what was the title? Unfolding. And now we're going to finish. Actually, I'm going to finish with the drawings here. So let's just go to the next room. Uh, OK, so the last wall, I'm going to finish with drawing, because I think it's a very interesting proposition to think about the painter and finish with drawing, because of course, drawing is fundamental. But like none of the paintings she ever made based on sketches, preliminary studies, right? I should never use any of that clearly and obviously enough. Drawing, too, was not preparatory. Drawing in and of itself became a kind of part of her practice um, since the 1950s, a very important one. The Babur, which will now close, I think, for two years or something in Paris at the end of 2023, the Saint Georges Pompidou in Paris, they have a whole collection of this series of drawings, this circular kind of things, going back to the arm, going back to the gesture, going back to the body, going back to the painterly performance, what every single painting in the show made by Judith Rag was created with. And, um, but I want you to propose something, the circularity, the sameness, the returns, how things come back how there are returns and rewritings and accumulations, both structurally speaking, but also conceptual in the work. Um, it's very interesting to see these. This is from the mid-60s. Almost looks like as an enlarged, right? A title, uh, like a detail, an enlarged detail of one of her eclatement series, right? You can think about these lines that they are they're photographed or, you know, and then silk screen. But this is drawing, again, one hand movement always fragmented, right? The large things are fragmented. The small things come to full circle. The scale is very interesting. The scale of the work in relation to bodies, whether her body or the viewer's body is interesting. But then here's this stuff here, 58, 1958, and 2010, 10 years before her death. She takes the paper again. She takes the ink again. She uses a sponge. She puts the sponge into the ink and makes these drawings which she decides to call Madarak birds. And there is the exact same physical investiture right? and the force. If you go to the Kistseli Museum's uh, church kind of space, uh, you can see a video of her when she does this on the floor on the scroll already a non-Western method, right? the horizontal scroll, it comes from Chinese and Japanese calligraphy. Um, working on the floor and she makes these very kind of you know forceful gestures and what comes out of it looks like a bird so she calls it birds but we could argue that it, is, it, it looks abstract after all it's birds because we project you know Sartre called this the imaginary viewing that when we see something we imagine something 
it's obstruction, but we see a landscape. It's obstruction, but we see a body, right? Uh, but this idea that she basically returns where she started, right? So there is nothing new, but everything changes all the time. That's a very lovely paradox. And when you think about her work, right, this paradox is one of the force behind to understand it. And there is also the integrity of it, right? The absolute kind of admirable integrity and autonomy of it. The not caring what is fashionable to some extent. And finally, the fact that, you know, during the last 15, 20 years, she finally, we are looking at her again and we learn to look at her with new eyes. So I hope that you will come back, you know, just not just once, but more than once to see more of the show and we'll discover things for yourself. Okay, that's all folks. Okay, thank you.